Welcome to the People Leaders Podcast, the audio resource for managers and business leaders creating high-performing teams. Join leadership and team development experts Jan and Michelle Turkelson each week as they explore both subjects from every angle. Through practical tips, valuable insights, and compelling interviews with leadership experts around the world, you'll learn how to bring out the best in your staff and how to give your best as a leader. now okay all right hello everyone um really looking forward to this session with you um, i'm flying solo michelle's not here at the moment she's looking after her teenage son who's um yeah done some damage to his hand but all is well however we've got a really special show um today for you and we've got a guest and our guest is uh jesse and jesse is all the way from Eastern Kentucky. And we're really fascinated with Jesse's story because it's very different to the leaders that we usually, or the, the leadership consultants that we usually deal with. And Jesse graduated from West Point in 2009 and um, served in the US Army as an aviation officer, um, flying helicopters, uh, including uh, his deployment in Afghanistan in 2013 as an intelligence officer for over 500 aviation task force. So that's um, a big responsibility. Um, following his final assignment as a company commander in 2016. And this is where um, he transitioned into the private sector. And he says that he, you know, those life experiences really fueled his passion for learning about leadership. And that's why we're bringing Jesse on today is because we want to hear about some of those lessons and um, experiences so we can, um, yeah, fuel our toolkit. And the other thing that I'd like Jesse to share with us is some of his core beliefs on leadership. So let's get into it. Hey, Jesse. Hey, Jen, how are you? Thanks for having me on. Excellent. We're really excited to have you on. Um, Michelle and I were just talking about it before and uh, she was bummed that she couldn't be on this one. Um, however, she gets to hear the recording. So yeah. isn't that good? <laughs> That's um, awesome. Yeah. And so, so some of the one of the questions that I've, I've got for you, um, which I was really interested in, was this notion of trust in leadership because you've spoken about the importance of trust um, in leadership and teams so can you tell us what you actually mean by trust yeah so for me trust first of all trust is a two-way street right so most time people think of trust and you think of it in a in, in kind of like a omnidirectional way or but it's it's really a two-way street so and it's also a concept that's built over time and it's earned, it's, it's not given. And, and to me, it's based around two primary principles and that's character and competence. So, <laughs> in, right. So in order for me as a leader to trust you, I have to understand, first of all, to me, the most important is your character, right? That like I can turn my head and trust that you are going to do the right thing, right? Because that's the most important, especially coming from my background in the military. And I, but I think second is the competence piece, right? And competence is something that can be built. And that's where we kind of get into the time concept of how trust can be earned over time. But going back to kind of your question, for me, trust, in order for me to be able to, you know, exercise trust with you and kind of a relationship is I need to be able to know that I can give you a task and I can give you broad direction and I can trust you to get it done without having to tell you the how, right? Mm -hmm. So I may be able to actually tell you the why, the purpose. And a lot of times in the military, we call this the commander's intent, right? So um, that's around a purpose, some key tasks that need to be done, and then ultimately a broad end state for what I want it to look like. But, but then I turn it over to you to try to figure out the how, right? And without me having to, to give you the direction. But then where the two-way street comes into play is that you have to know that me as your leader, I have your back. So if you fail, and you fail going 100 miles an hour in the right direction, doing the right thing, I'm going to not throw you out to dry or throw you under the bus, as we say in the mm -hmm. States, right? I'm going to be there to help you learn and grow from it. So for me, trust is a concept of being able to turn your back, ensure that something's going to be done, and it's going to be done in a way that's consistent with the core values that you have as a company and as a leader. Yeah, right on. You um we're singing from the same songbook because <laughs> when you were talking about that character and competence, um, we often refer to Covey's, you know, mm -hmm. that, that extension of trust. And 
it seems like you're describing delegation, you know, when oh, you, extend, you, you extend trust. And what was the terminology you used? What's the army's terminology? About? Yeah, so it's called the commander's intent. So it's something if you're familiar with, oh, um, right. yeah, so it's, it's just my intent for, hey, here's the purpose, some key tasks that like I may need to make sure that get done. But then I'm not telling you how to do it. I'm just giving you a broad end state with that too. It's saying, here's what I want it to look like when it's complete roughly. Now, mm. Jan, you go figure out how you're going to get this done. And yeah. that's, that's empowerment, right? So trust and empowerment are hand in hand. So in order to, to delegate, because delegation is a, a popular word, but a lot of times you can't delegate blindly, right? Because one of the things as a leader is you could delegate a task, but you don't delegate the responsibility. Mm. The responsibility still lies with you. So you're still responsible for whether that team succeeds or that team fails. Because ultimately it's it's you as the leader. You're not judged by your own act. You're judged by your own actions, but you're not judged by your own performance. You're judged by the performance of the team. And that's where that trust and that all that comes into play. Because if you don't have that, then you're going to wear yourself out as a leader because you can't do everything, right? So mm-hmm. that's where the trust really comes into play. Yeah, I was having a conversation with someone um, yesterday, a coaching conversation, and um, they were talking about they felt that they were being micromanaged mm. and um, talking about, okay, so how do I have a conversation with my leader about how I'm feeling about that? Because it may not be that they don't trust them. It's just that that's how they are operating at the moment. And um, I think it's really interesting when we talk about how do you extend trust, you extend it by actually handing over or entrusting them with right. work. But really, you know, like you don't yep. just um, give it and then like take half of it away. You <laughs> actually have to have that risk because there's a risk involved, isn't there? From that's right. That. There, yeah. There's a, the, yep, go ahead. Sorry. No, I was just going to say, so can you give us another example of how, in your experience, people have extended trust, how a leader has shown that they trust their team or a subordinate or? Yeah, so I, I think that it, one, of the, one of the first things is that two-way street has to be built, right? And in order for that two-way street to be built, people have to know that you care. And some of the, some of the best things as a leader you can do before you can extend that is to go in, in what we may call like, you know, lead by example or get your own boots dirty. You know, if you're in a manufacturing environment, you know, you go find the, the nastiest, dirtiest, filthiest job that you could possibly imagine that somebody on your team's doing. Mm-hmm. And then you do it with them because that's showing empathy, right? So I think empathy is a key to that, you know, is, is, to, is to show people that you care about them and you're willing to get down and get dirty with them because that empathy will lead to humility in a lot of ways, right? Because the two are used kind of interchangeably, but you're going to humble yourself because you may be the, you may be the CEO, the founder CEO, or you may be the general manager, whatever your title is, but getting down there, getting in the weeds, getting dirty with people, that's going to show humility. And then that humility leads to, you know, kind of vulnerability. I'm kind of taking you on a journey here to get to the Mm -hmm. answer. That, That vulnerability then is what breeds that trust, right? So then if those people know that you care about them, that you're willing to get down and get and get, you know, kind of filthy and nasty and do the dirty jobs with them, and they're going to trust you. And then the fact that you're being vulnerable with them, whenever you're, you're being humble, then you can start to say like, Hey, you know, I I need you to go do this. And you can then really trust because they're going to trust you that you have what's their best interest in mind whenever anything you do. But then two is, you know, not only are they going to trust you, but you can trust them because you've been down there and you've worked with them. You have to build relationships. Mm -hmm. So before you can just blindly delegate, and maybe you start with something small, right? You mm-hmm. could start with something, you know, very small, like whatever the smallest task you could think of. But then people gradually build confidence. And it's not just about you building confidence in them. It's about them building confidence in their self. Because the leader you just mentioned that you've been talking to, um, that feels like they're being micromanaged. You know, a, a good piece of advice for people in that situation is ask for, ask for things to do. Mm-hmm. And ask for small things to do. And then show your boss that you can get them done. And then once your boss kind of knows they can rely on you, mm. then those tasks start to get bigger. Those and the ownership becomes more and more on you. And that's what you want anyway. If you if you're if you're not wanting to be micromanaged. So a roundabout way of answering is you know get down, get dirty, 
build trust because you build relationships and then you can start that delegation. Yeah, I, I love that term about building because building means that it's kind of like an ongoing process and then you can create some momentum and um, extend trust more and more. Um, so I'm really interested in your time at West Point. Can you, and I know, like, usually we send questions beforehand, but, you know, I'm just going to jump in here and, and okay. add another one. So, Jesse, at your time at West Point, can you share with us um, an experience that really shifted the way in which you approached either leading teams or dealing with um, people in situations that you thought, wow, I never saw it that way, you know, like shifted a perspective? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, wow, um, there's a ton of examples I could pull from. You know, one of, the, one of the great things about, you know, being at West Point for four years is you're kind of in a um, a leadership laboratory, if you will, you know, a lot of it's controlled, but then a lot of it too is you're learning from people, you know, for example, each, you know, cadet company has a, a captain or a major that's a combat veteran and a, you know, an, a non-commissioned officer is a combat veteran assigned to it as well. And they're mentoring you along the way. And probably one of the best lessons and one of the most humbling lessons that I ever learned was my second year at West Point. So your first year, you're kind of learning to follow right? So you're there, you're in charge of yourself, you get tasked, you're in charge of it, you're not really in charge of people. Um, your second year, you start to get in charge of one or two people. So for me, as a team leader, as we would call it at that point, I was in charge of two people. And every morning at West Point, regardless of the weather in northern New York, you will have what's an accountability formation before you go to breakfast. So this is 6 a.m., 6.30 in the morning, and you're down and making sure, hey, everybody's here, you know, if there's any information we put out, but then you go to breakfast. Well, one morning I get down there and my two, you know, cadets didn't show up. And okay, you know, I didn't think too much of it. Like most people that are 19 years old, you don't think much of it. Um, so I'm just kind of like, okay, you know, let's get on with life, just move on. Well, after the formation was over, <clears throat> my NCO, tactical NCO that I mentioned before, is a combat veteran, has so much respect for this guy. His name was Forrest Blum. Um, he's a sergeant first class. He calls me to the back, you know, okay, Cadet Curry, come here. I went back there and he asked me, hey, where are your guys? And to me, I said, you know, kind of nonchalantly, well, I, I guess they overslept, right? And he goes, oh, okay. Well, you're responsible for, the, for, for those guys. So let me ask you this. If we we're in Baghdad, because at the time this was 2006, he's like, you're in Baghdad and you can't find your two guys. So are you going to then behave this nonchalantly or are you going to finally realize that you're responsible for more than just yourself? And to me, I felt like I was six inches tall because I, I went from at that moment realizing that like, Hey, I'm responsible for these people. And it was a, it was a proverbial kind of game to me, if you will, because I'm 19 years old, I'm figuring this out to realizing that these were real lessons that, you know, this guy had been on multiple tours in Afghanistan and Iraq and he just taught me a huge lesson that like, hey, you don't know where these guys are and, and you can assume all you want to, but your assumptions are, you know, there's an old saying about assumptions, right? And, mm. uh, we, you know, so you don't want to do them. And once you do that and I assume something, he really brought me down to my level. And a lot of times, you know, he never raised his voice, but probably the most, um, you know, impactful lesson I learned early on was that at that point you go into something that's kind of, I know Jocko Willink, um, he's kind of a, an entrepreneur himself in the U S he's a former Navy SEAL, but he calls it extreme ownership. That's extreme ownership. And that's realizing that you're not responsible for, you know, like I said earlier, just your actions. Yeah. You're not responsible for just yourself. Now you're responsible for other people. Mm. And wow, that was a huge lesson very early on that, you know, for a lot of people, you probably would have reacted exactly the same way I did. Um, but, you know, I learned really quickly and it didn't happen to me again. Great. You know, and that, that's the, um, a true leader is to be able to give you the lesson and you actually physically have embodied it. You own it. So you can yeah. do, yeah, have a mistake, but you just don't want to, you know, do it again. And I love what, you know, that idea of, you know, what you do in, at any time in your career or life, there is 
you know, we don't want to diminish that, you know, we're, wherever you are, there you go. So even in any small task, are you being the leader that you, are, you aspire to be? So right. whether it's just leading yourself or leading a task or leading people. And I love that gradual approach that you have. That, right. that, that's awesome. Um, so with, in West Point, I imagine that there is a lot of physical activity that you do. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Okay. And what do you think um, for people again, I'm, I'm so the people who are listening to us now, they obviously wouldn't be um, uh, as disciplined as um, West Point graduates. Can you give us a, an idea is if someone needed to do a workout, right. For 10 or 15 minutes, knowing your experience, uh, at West Point, what would you suggest to them? Yeah, so I, I think a, that's a great question. I think a lot of that depends on your current conditioning and your and your, your current experience, right? But I'm a big believer in the whole idea of the of hit training, right? It's a high intensity interval training. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times as entrepreneurs, we get busy, right? So you know, when you're starting a business and maybe you're still doing your nine to five at the same time, like I am, and you find that it's hard, even if, you know, I wake up at 4.15 every morning and I go to the gym, but sometimes even then you can't fit the gym in because you have other things you need to do. But in 15 minutes, I mean, mm. but, but, you know, doing some burpees, going out for a quick, you know, two mile run, you know, doing things that you can do without, because a lot of times we, we are so used to saying, well, I need a gym for that. You don't need a gym, right? Mm. Because some of the best workouts and that I've ever had have been with people in, in a fit in an open field with maybe a pull up bar, you know, tires to flip. There's a whole lot of things you can do. And that's one of the great things about, you know, being in the military is you learn, especially when you're deployed or you're away in training is you, you learn that you can do a workout anywhere. Um, and, and whether it's with water jugs or whatever. So to answer your question is you could fit in push-ups, you could fit in burpees, you can do ab exercises, pull-ups, you name it is the biggest thing is, is it a priority to you? And as a leader, right, as entrepreneurs and as leaders, if you're not in good physical condition, you're not going to bring your best mental self to work. So if you're struggling to stay awake at one o'clock in the day, because you're not in good shape or, you know, you're, you're overweight and, and you have health problems, you're taken away from what you could be providing. So yeah. it's huge. It's, it's, yeah. uh, I'm a big believer in, in, you know, kind of staying in shape and there's no reason you can't. Yeah, I hear you. So at West Point, so obviously, you know, at the Leadership Academy, you talked, um, you would learn a lot about that leadership theory. You did some physical activity. Were there any aspects of the training that led you down the mindfulness path or looking at the power of the mind and emotions? Yeah, so um, de definitely. So there was one class in particular that um, I took when I was at West Point. Everybody takes, it's a, it's, it's a core leadership development class, um, PL 300 or PL 350. And in there, you learn a lot about like the different, you know, styles of leadership. You learn a lot about different models, you know, the basis of power and, and all these other things. But it really makes you think about the psychology behind leadership, right? And you being as a leader, so there's like a, I believe it's called a, Center for Enhanced Performance that they have up there too. And they, and they teach you about things like, hey, take a 15 minute power nap. Here's what a 15 minute power nap does for your mind. Mm -hmm. So on, on top of that, with the PL350, you really get to learn how you, how, how you can interact with people on more than just a, you know, kind of personal level, but on a psychological level as well. And you get to learn like, hey, this is how some people interpret this. This is how you make, this is what tough, making a tough decision does to your body. Here's what that actually happens to your body whenever right, you're making these yeah. 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 So yeah. yeah, to answer your question, you do get into some of that mindfulness. You I mean, you learn, you learn things about the power naps. You can learn how to do, you know, kind of meditation and things, but a lot of it, you know, there's a lot of that's elected, but the core PL 350 class is really where you get to learn about that interaction with the human mind and leadership right. as well. Right. So I imagine um, when you were being deployed, there were a lot of situations where you actually had to problem solve or come up with some solution. Is there a criteria, like a problem solving criteria or a model that you all use or is it a combination of gut and 
process. I, I think it's more gut and process, right? And experience. Mm -hmm. And the and the beautiful thing about the military is, you know, you can be when when you graduate from when I graduated from West Point, you know, I was a second lieutenant. I was a platoon leader shortly thereafter, and I had you know eighteen to twenty four folks that I was in charge of, and. The, the the most interesting thing about it was I'm 22 or 23 years old mm -hmm. and I have people in my organization as warrant officers, as pilots that are in their 40s that are nearing retirement in the military. And a lot of times, you know, the, the it goes back to kind of the humility piece is humble yourself and realize that you're not the smartest person in the room. Mm -hmm. And if you're willing to, to, you know, you're faced with a problem, the worst thing you can do is rush to failure. So a lot of times we try to figure out, you know, what's my instinct? How am I going to approach this? But part of being a leader is you, you have a collective mind. And yeah. if you think that you're the smartest person in the room, you know, Jack Welch, the former you know, CEO of GE in the U.S., always had a saying that, you know, if he's the smartest person in the room, he's already failed. Um, <laughs> because you can't do everything. It goes back to what we we're talking about before with delegation and, and, and whatnot. But, you know, it's not just delegation of tasks, it's delegation of the thought process. So rely on those people. And, but as far as, you know, having a, 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 a you know, a, a model, no, it's more, you know, experiential and really sitting back and learning from other people's experiences. That's awesome. So uh, we deal a lot with um, teams and uh, high performing teams. And there are certain dimensions that teams need to embody if they are going to be high performing. And, and some of the behaviours that we see. So one of them is that team members are able to have robust conversations with each other, that they feel safe enough to, to do that um, so that they can challenge the, the status quo. And the fact that they can uh, extend trust to be able to do that yeah so can you give us an example of ways that so if I'm leading a team now what 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 could I do to foster trust amongst the team I think the so first I thing is is you know that you have to realize that in order to foster trust you have to value the individuals within your team and realize that each person is different individually and going back to what we talked about before with kind of that empathy and humility piece, but it's getting to know them, building that individual relationship, but also having them buy into your collective team mission, right? Mm -hmm. So each, each team has a, you have an objective to meet as a leader in, in some form or fashion. It could be a production amount, it could be whatever. But one of the, one of the best things you can do though, to get people to buy into that mission, right? Which is ultimately what you wanna to do to be able to build that trust is, take care of the people. You know, when you have one-on-ones with people, don't just focus on the business piece, focus on them as a person. What are their goals, you know, and help them, help build them. And once you do that and the people care and realize that you care about them and you don't just care about, you know, what they're doing for you and use them as a means to an end, but instead you care about them and building them along with your team. It's kind of the Southwest Airlines approach. I don't know if you're familiar with Southwest Airlines, but it's, a, it's a airlines in the U.S. It was everybody always before the Southwest Airlines model was focus on the customer, focus on the customer. Southwest Airlines flipped that, right? And they said, focus on the individuals, focus on the team members. Mm -hmm. Once you focus on the team members, they're going to then take care of your mission, right? Mm -hmm. That's trust. Because you, you mentioned earlier is as a leader, part of trusting people is being vulnerable because you're putting a risk out there. Mm. When you trust somebody with anything, you, you're taking a risk as a leader because you, uh, you now have taken it kind of out of your hands. And as human beings, we all want to control our environment, right? But you gave it to somebody else. But if you've built that relationship and they've bought into your mission and you're taking care of them, they're going to take care of your mission. And then you really get to value, you really get to show them how much you value them. And that's how you start to then start to delegate, then start to build that trust because they realize again that you're taking care of them. That's your number one priority and the rest mm. follows. Yeah, I love that. Because uh, we often say that because we get a lot of questions about how do I motivate my team? And to that point, you motivate them by actually knowing them, understanding what their um, you know, points are of um, interest are, um, what the differences are in your teams that you can actually leverage that because that's the best way of motivating someone is by actually knowing them and then because you build trust, yeah, it, it extends. Um, and to your point about the airlines, Virgin did that. 
So oh, Virgin yeah. Airlines, that's their focus yeah. on um, their people. Because yep. once you they take care of each other, they'll take care of the, the client. And you can see it. It's a different culture when you hop on a plane. There's a, a, a levity. There's just a, a, yeah, a different sense to it. So, yeah. yeah, that's an interesting pick up. So, one of your core beliefs about leadership is uh, exceptional leaders are the product of persistent education and development. Um, in other words, leaders never stop trying to improve. Mm. Can mm. you give us some examples of what you have seen, like practical examples, as opposed to just, you know, doing a course or whatever, that leaders can improve their um, education and develop around, development around leadership? Yeah, so I think one of the most simple things we can all do as leaders is read. Right. So a lot of times, you know, it's it, it, when we, we talked about earlier, you get busy as an entrepreneur, you get busy as a leader, but it is is read and learn from others because that's that's the value of, of reading is you're learning just like you, you and I as, as coaches, you want to help people avoid mistakes that you see that you have either made or you see other people make. But one of the ways that you can do that very simply, if, if you don't have a coach or maybe you don't have the budget for a coach is read. And find people that are, you know, that have written autobiographies or, or have had, you know, published in Harvard Business Review and other things that you can then pull from and learn from that. The other thing is find opportunities. You know, if you're in a large corporation or if you're an entrepreneur and, you, and you're on your own, is find opportunities to take, you know, what, I, what I'll call prudent risks. Because those risks are going to grow you because of that experience. So it, it may be that like you're, you, you know, you've always done all the coaching in your business and you're a coach, but maybe you have some other people on your team and, and maybe you want to teach them how to coach and maybe you're giving them their first client and it's hard because that's your baby. You've built that business, but then you're going to give it and you're going to let them have that, you know, opportunity to learn and that opportunity to grow. Because if you want to scale your business, you're not going to be able to do one-on-one -on -one coaching forever mm -hmm. um, because there's only one of you and there's only 24 hours in a day. Mm -hmm. So yeah. um, if you want to be able to do it, you know, take that prudent risk, you know, train people, but then learn to trust them by taking that risk. And it's going to grow you as an individual. It's going to grow you as a leader. Um, you know, push your own comfort zones. That's, that's the best advice I, I've ever been given is push your own comfort zones because mm -hmm. Our, our human nature is kind of like a thermostat, right? So I've heard many people use this analogy before is your thermostat is if you, if you set it at, you know, 15 C or 20 C, whatever it's, if you, if your room gets hot, that thermostat is going to bring it back down. That's your comfort zone. And if it gets too cold, it's going to bring it back up. That's your comfort zone. You have to find a way to get outside that comfort zone and adjust your own internal thermostat. That's probably yeah. the, 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 you know, the hardest thing for us to do as leaders, but probably the most important. Yeah, I love that. And especially like reading is the theoretical part, then it's the actual doing. And yep. I love your term about prudent risk because anyone who's listening to this podcast now, you know, mm -hmm. just reflect in the past week, where have you taken prudent risk? Can you identify it? What was the outcome? What did you learn about it? Because a lot of the times we um, suggest to leaders to actually have a leadership journal where they do some mm -hmm. um, journaling, meaning they set an intention for the day. And at the end of the day, they'll write, you know, answer three questions. You know, what did I learn? What would I do differently? And what was I proud of? Oh, and awesome. every now and then put in something like, where did I take prudent risk? I love that as a um, as a question because it actually gets you to think differently. So just wrapping up, Jesse, um, one of the things that we talk uh, a lot about is feedback because, uh, again, that is another way that we can learn and grow as leaders. Can you tell me your thinking around feedback? Yeah, so feedback to me is, you know, I've often heard the expression is feedback is a gift right? Because it's, 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 it's free. It's almost like if you have a team and you have that trust built, that feedback to you is somebody being honest with your best intentions in mind. But the other part is take your ego out of it. It's the worst three letter word in, in, in the dictionary. If you take your ego out of it, a lot of times you'll find that people, a lot of times people can confuse, you know, people's feedback with dissent. And it's not the same thing. If you take your ego out of it and you allow to realize that yourself to realize that the people have your best intentions, have your team's best intentions in mind when they're giving you this feedback, 
then you're going to, you're really going to grow. So my, you know, for me is, you know, I always tell people look 360 degrees for your feedback. You know, it's oftentimes if you're in a large organization, you may only look up for feedback, right? So you may look to your boss because they're writing your review, or you may look to your peers, but you also need to look down that chain too. You know, how is your team feeling about how your performance is? And some of the best leaders, some of the things I've learned from the best leaders is at the end of, you know, one-on-one -on -one conversations or, or whatever is they ask, Hey, what can I do better? Mm. It's opening yourself up because mm. a lot of times people may not going back to trust. They may not have that relationship built with you yet to where they're mm. just willing to give it. But if you ask, if you prompt them, maybe the first time it catches them off guard and they're not ready for it. But the second time you ask and they find that you're going to ask that, it's going to allow them to start taking mental notes to come back to you with feedback. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm a huge believer in it. Uh, if you're not taking it, you're, you're cheating yourself. I love that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I've been taking notes as we've been um, talking, you know, like um, some of the, the, the biggest things for me, has, the takeaway is the, that notion around taking prudent risk Mm -hmm. um, I love that question at the end of the conversation, at the one-on-one mm -hmm. conversation, what can I do better? Because a lot of the time, sometimes leaders say, you know, what can I do to support you? As opposed to what can I actually do better or what can I do differently that will support right. you? Yeah, right. I love that. Um, and also the fact that, that with your um, capacity to lead, it is an ongoing process where you build and um, you've given some great examples around that um, that has been really um, interesting Jesse thank you so much is there anything else that you want to leave this with you know like, I, what are you I, working on or projects or oh sure insights? yeah you know I, I you know I, I'm, I'm by no means think I'm smart enough to leave anybody with one leadership bullet that's going to really define <laughs> define their careers or anything like that because there's so much that could be covered but no I, you know I think one of the biggest things is is to realize that leadership is a journey right mm -hmm. um, it, you're going to have a lot of times the valleys before you get to the peaks in, in that journey you may have to you know we talked about building trust today it, it takes time it, you know mm -hmm. it's in the, in, a, in a 30 minute or one hour podcast, it sounds very simple. And, and, and the concept is simple, right? But the actual implementation of it is realize it takes time. And it is a journey to get there. And, you know, for me, you know, I, I you can find if you want to stay in touch with me, you can find me I'm on Instagram, you know, at first string leader, the name of the company's first string leadership, you know, I'm doing more one on one coaching. So if that's something that's interested and, in, you know, feel free to go on the website and sign up. But no, I, I really appreciate you having me on. It's been a joy being on here talking leadership with you. It's one of my obviously one of my favorite things to talk mm -hmm. about. And then yeah. it's always good to, you know, kind of go cross culture too, right? So we're all Western cultures, but we all have different, you know, kind of approaches to everything. So uh, I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Oh, my pleasure, Jesse. So um, we'll link those in our notes as well. So people, are you on LinkedIn at all? I am, yes, I'm on LinkedIn Oh, great, too. okay. All right, yep. so we can um, find you on LinkedIn as well. That's been fascinating. Thank you so much, Jesse, and definitely stay in touch. That sounds good, Jan. Thank you. Ciao. Yep. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the People Leaders Podcast. For show notes and other resources, please visit us at peopleleaderspodcast.com. While you're there, you can subscribe for future episodes so you can continue your own leadership journey. And please be sure to share this and other episodes with your friends and colleagues. The People Leaders Podcast is brought to you by the Experts On Air Podcast Network.